So Miru wears lots of different hats around Vancouver. Co-founder of Vidge's Restaurant and Rangoli and Shadik Restaurant in Seattle, which I ate at recently. And uh, she's also behind Joy of Feeding, which she'll tell you about. It's a great event coming up at the end of June. Um, so lots of different things, and she's very, very involved in the Vancouver Food Committee. So uh, welcome, Miru. Hi, everybody. So one thing I just want to say that I share with Karen is that I also have absolutely no professional experience um, in cooking and in the food business. And I am an absolute accidental restaurateur. I'm an accidental chef, and I don't think you're going to find a person who loves her job more than I do. And when I was growing up in the Washington, D.C. area, we grew up, um, I, I hit America in 1969. I was about four years old from India. And I'm just going to back up a bit. So my parents made it very clear to me how fortunate I was through the chance of being in this particular woman's womb. That there was nothing special about me that got me to America. It was just sheer luck. They left India to make my life good, and I better as hell do a good job at it. <laughs> so that was just ingrained in me from the age of four onwards. And, um, and, and, and we were lower middle class the whole time. My mother was, you know, my mom spoke no English. She was about 27 years old when she came to America. I was, you know, I hadn't even entered kindergarten yet. My dad was the engineer. He got the visas. He spoke English. And my mother was very isolated. She was pulled from her community and she was taking care of two children. And, um, and you know, it's only in retrospect that I realized that my mother had so much talent. My mother was not this passive housewife who watched soap operas all day, which is what I thought and I was so ashamed of. My mother didn't know where to go in this new country. Um, and so for me, you know, growing up, I never looked at my mother as a role model. I was always looking at other women as role models. And I was looking at my father as a role model. And so I'm gonna get back to my mother later on, but at the same time, one thing my mother was very firm on was we didn't have a lot of money. I didn't have the blessing of braces or going to the dentist and doctors and health insurance and we had two pairs of pants. And, but one thing that was just a must was food in the house. And there were no shortcuts with food. Money on food was just not even discussed and my mother couldn't buy anything as far as my Indian dad was concerned but he never ever limited her on the food budget. We spent weekends going to farmer's markets before we even knew they were farmer's markets. I was bored to death in that car, driving 45 minutes, and then watching my mom and dad pick all, you know, I just didn't get it, but that's how I grew up. I grew up just going to farmer's market, and I did. I grew up with a generosity of love and food, and I grew up knowing that as messed up as mom and dad were as these immigrant misfits, I was the apple of their eye. And this is all gonna come back when I talk about how I became the accidental restaurateur chef today. So um, I was never allowed in high school to work at a restaurant. Um, and this is gonna go back to the bar and the hostess comment that Karen was making, but my parents said, only sluts work in restaurants. <laughs> and when I was 14, 15 years old, that sounded great to me. Like, Whoa, it's a, that's how I'm gonna get a guy. I've gotta work at a restaurant. But I was not, I wasn't even allowed to scoop ice cream at the Baskin Robbins because I was gonna become a slut if I went to Baskin Robbins. And as much as they wanted me to Americanize myself and be a really good, successful American, one thing they did not want me to do was become an American slut because you see, all American girls had sex and I was not gonna have sex. So I got scared. I actually, you know, I, I got scared of the restaurant business and I never worked. And so my very first job was um, at a daycare center. I worked with children, very safe job. It was a great job. Um, I remember the other 17 year old girls had tips coming in because they were bus tables or what have you. And um, it was in, it, it, at some point I started looking up to people who worked at restaurants. That was a world that I did not have access to. I wasn't cool as the girls and guys who worked in restaurants. I didn't have the tip money as the girls and guys who worked in restaurants. I was the good girl who worked at the daycare center, then she worked at Bloomingdale's, and then she worked at the Justice Department, then she got involved with Amnesty International, and then she got her bachelor's degree in French, and then she got her master's degree in economics, and then she wanted to save the world. But that was a sexy world that I did not have access to. And, but I loved my world as well because 
What, again, it rings through what your parents tell you is, you know what, you were born by the luck of the womb of the woman who had you. And so, for me, it's important everything I do reminds me that I could have been one of those children in India that I used to go back to India and see on the streets. My parents were not well off. They were refugees from a war. And once you've seen the poverty and once you've seen the hunger, and they're your blood, right? They're not, you're not white and black. And I mean, they're your blood. You know, and, and whether we like it or not, human nature, we respond differently to our own blood. And so I've always been aware of my blood, even though I can't relate to my blood, what's going on there in India. And so I worked in third world development. I worked in economic development projects in Africa, in uh, South America, ev everywhere around the world from in Washington, DC. So now we're gonna fast forward, I'm 30 years old, I meet Vikram, and he tells me that uh, he's just opened up a bistro in Vancouver. And I was like, okay. Now by this time I'm in Washington, DC, I've been there eight years, I've got money, I go out all the time. And so I'm thinking, okay, I'm, you know, I'm gonna, I've met this guy and he has a bistro in Vancouver. And I get to Vancouver and I see this bistro and the carpet's got holes in it and it stinks. It's an electric <laughs> stove in the back. Um, it's 14 seats and no one's in there. And I'm like, what the F is this, like, bistro? Like, I can't, like, no, no, this is not the restaurant world. Like, no, I was really resentful that I finally met a guy in the restaurant world. This is not the restaurant in my world that, that I've been really yearning for all this time. And, you know, and, and I was a little taken aback by this bistro of his. But um, as much as I was taken aback by the bistro, I fell in love with him. And we had a five-day romance, and at the end of the five days, he proposed to me. And um, I said, no, no, I don't. I've already been divorced once, and I've never even been with an Indian. Like, you're the first Indian, and I'm not sure I trust Indians, really. Um, so, no. I will go back to Washington, D.C. I will work. We'll have a long-distance relationship, and then I'll come back in June, and we can live together. That, so that was my thing. And then he says to me, um, I'm not doing long-distance. And I've, I've just opened up a restaurant, and I need to focus on restaurant. I've got a life to live. I'm willing to give you the rest of my life right now, or end it. And it took me about one second to say, okay, sure, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> and I was 30 years old, and I thought to myself, you know, I'd much rather be that 80-year-old who says, remember that time I met that fat Indian boy? <laughs> and I married him, and... It didn't work out, but you know, I, I'd rather be that woman who said, I tried it out and it didn't work, than be the woman resenting and regretting her life because she was so chicken shit, she didn't try anything in life. And so I moved to Vancouver. And when I moved here, you know, and this is another thing we Americans have, we know nothing about Canada. So I could have told you at that time in 1994, the capital of every single country in the world, who the president was and what political turmoil was going on in that country, but I didn't even know where the hell Vancouver was actually. And so when I showed up, we got, you know, um, we got married on Christmas Eve, and then I went back to DC, finished up my projects, and when I showed up at Vancouver, the guy at the airport says, ma'am, um, you know, what's the purpose of your visit? And I was like, oh, I'm not visiting, I'm moving here. And he just looked at me like, huh? And I said, oh, I got married and I'm moving here. But, and I had abs like, I just came as that arrogant American, not even thinking I needed to get any sort of immigration papers. <laughs> and he says, we can't just let, you can't just move to Canada like that. And I was like, well, what do you mean? I've already given away my apartment. <laughs> and, like, you know, my sister has a new roommate and stuff. And he goes, man, this is just not how it works in Canada. And I'm like, well, I can't go back, like I need, to, I, I can't go back. And I think I threw enough of a lame, innocent pity party with the guy that he says, just go in, just you're a visitor, just go in and apply. And he gave me all the papers because an American can come in as a visitor. So I did not have a work permit for the first four months that I was in Vancouver. I just, I was in the kitchen and Vikram worked all day. We didn't know each other that well, but here we were married. And so I started hanging out in the back of this 14-seat bistro. And obviously I'm not gonna sit still. 
And uh, we were, you know, sometimes we would make four dollars and I, it wasn't very busy, but <laughs> Vikram came up with this idea of giving chai to people who came in. And it's not then, you know, and, and chai is, it was a new concept. Starbucks had not yet gotten hold of this word. And I was like, okay, chai is a good idea. And going back to chai in terms of my mother, she taught me how to make chai when I was about nine years old. And it was very important that for an Indian, chai is piping hot. And the color has to be perfect. The texture has to be perfect. It's a very delicate thing to make a good chai. And when I was nine years old, you know, she taught me how to do it. And I remember I was, you know, on the stove, on a stool, and making it piping hot for my mother, the boil, and I poured it into the cardamom uh, cup, and it all spilled all over my stomach. And I still have the scars all over my stomach from the chai. And I'm yelling and screaming, and my mother said, oh, I've got to first deal with you, and then drink my chai. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, I burnt myself, I had to go to the hospital, I, I mean, it was a bad burn, but once I was better, my mother put me back on the stool and taught me how to make chai. It was very important for her. So here I am now 30 years old, and my brand new husband's brand new bistro, and I noticed that the chai he was making was disgusting. And it was discolored, it was thick, the milk was coating all over it, and I just quietly went to the back and I figured out how can I make a chai that you can keep on the stove, the flavor is still delicate, the color is still nice, but you're not making a new batch every time, like customers are getting this chai quickly. And so I very quietly spent two weeks coming up with a chai, gave it to Vikram, and I said, now serve this, and it was a big hit. And so that was the beginning of my career in the restaurant business. So then from chai, we didn't have a liquor license. And I thought, well, Coke sucks with Indian food. It kind of bursts your chest when you're drinking Coke. And so then I came up with a ginger lemon drink because the ginger lemon drink, it matched eating Indian food. And after that, it was just nonstop. I was there for about a month and I had already come up with, well, let's do coconut curried vegetables. And that's when I realized at some point that I've got a nose. I can smell, I can smell spices, I can smell things, and it was such an, it's the way, you know, I'm imagining is the equivalent of, you know, when you accidentally get pregnant and you're like, fuck, I'm having a baby and I don't want one, right? <laughs> and then when you have that baby, you're such a good mother and you love that baby so much. And so that's what happened to me and food. The, like, wow, like I didn't get the front of the house and all the sex that I was looking forward to, but I got the back of the house and I'm loving it as much as anything else. And so it just became nonstop. And because I approach food from a very different angle than anybody who's professionally trained as a chef, you know, I was, my ego was not up there. I, I was really happy to be in the back. I was really happy, you know, Amarjeet was there. I could barely speak Hindi at that time and she definitely couldn't speak any English, but we communicated fine. And I put on the gloves and I loved being in the kitchen. And so my first technical job for Vikram was I was the dishwasher, but we didn't have a machine. I was the hand dishwasher with the three section sink. But to do the dishwashing, I knew that as soon as I was done, I could start chopping more onions and I would do it like this and cut myself. And I just, the thing is, I didn't care because I was so happy where I was. It didn't bother me how I was cutting or not. And so I could be creative. Amarjeet and I got this relationship going. And then um, we got busier because the chai helped, the ginger lemon drink helped, my coconut curried vegetables helped. Vikram and I are in love, we're a new couple, so he's got love energy in the front with all the customers, <laughs> right? So, I mean, it's good, you know, and slowly 14 seats goes to 21 seats, and then we decide to decorate, and, and, and we, we grew, you know, we grew together. But what stuck with me was I approached food the way I realized I approached life. Generosity breeds generosity. And we today have a very, very tough time just being generous with each other. And through food, I can love you, I can be generous with you, I can show you what I'm capable of doing, I can change the environment, right? I can, you're crying, I can fix you with food. Think about this, there is such power in just the word food. And there's a lot of power in the word food 
even if you don't have an ego behind it. And so you think about this, power without ego is a beautiful thing, and that's what food is for me. It's just, this is how I express myself. And getting back down to my mother, um, everybody loves to ask me, why do I have an all-female uh, all female cooks in my kitchens? It was never on purpose. It was never because, you know, I had any prejudices against anybody. We've had guys in the kitchen. But if, my, if anybody had given my mother the chance that I gave Amarjeet, who was my mother back in 1969, my mother could have been a completely different person. I'm not saying she's pathetic right now, but she could have had something in her life. As an immigrant who spoke no English, she could have had power through something she was beautiful at doing. And so that's why I started hiring my mothers at the restaurant. And it was, for me, do you love to cook? Yes. Do you know Indian spices? Yes. Are you okay with working hard? Yes. Come on, this is your cooking school. So then I became the cooking school to the women who started applying for jobs at the restaurant. And not a single woman has left. And my kitchen staff now at Vidges is 19 years old, starting from Amarjeet, all the way to the last person I hired, which is probably about 11 years old, uh, like 11 years ago. Same thing with my Rangoli staff. I've never lost any kitchen staff. And I wouldn't say it's because, oh my gosh, Miro and Bikram are such great payers. Sure, we pay well, but it's not that. It's the bond that we have with each other. And I make it very clear. This kitchen is serving food for every reason besides money and ego. And hopefully, we'll earn a lot of money while we're doing it. And, um, and it's worked out that way. And for the longest, and you know, I want to get back to being a woman and you know, being in the food business. It was not easy at the same time. Luckily, I was so oblivious in my La La Land for about 10 years. You know, I was new to Canada. I was having babies. Um, I was so happy. I was a pig in mud in my kitchen. I didn't care that I wasn't getting any recognition for what I was doing. It it just didn't bug me at the time. Well, not at the time, it just didn't bother me. I was really okay that I'm doing what I'm doing. I wanted to hone in on my skills. Just because I realized I had a good nose doesn't mean that I can just go up and show off my nose. I gotta work on it. And so for 10 years, I just, I, I did what I did quietly, passionately, surrounded by people that I loved. And then I was ready to come out to the world and say, all right, Vancouver, here I am. I know you think that Vikram Mitch does every single thing at the restaurant, you know? Um, that's fine with me, but hello, here I am from the kitchens, here's my cookbook, here's my Rangoli, and now I'm not gonna shut up. And so, that's how that worked out. And um, I've decided that, you know, I've got a stage, I've got some power, and so again, the power for me, and what I wanna do outside of my restaurants is breed generosity. I'm an immigrant. And that's the nationality I call myself now. I'm not an American, I'm not an Indian, I'm not a Canadian, because when I was in America, the whole time, where are you from, where are you from? Oh, I'm from India. Then I'm in Canada, where are you from, where are you from, I'm from America. And I realized, who do I relate with really? It's immigrant, I'm an immigrant, that's my nationality. And so, uh, real quick, I've got a stage, and I've, I've developed a triangle, a human triangle, which I really want to promote to all of us. And so use your imaginations with this triangle. In the middle of the triangle is body and soul. And that's what each and every one of us has, is a body and soul. And we must empathize with everybody else's body and soul, and not just ours, and that's generosity. On the top of that triangle, imagine the sky, it's the environment. Without a healthy, clean environment, a lot of us are in denial, a lot of us feel powerless, but without a clean, healthy environment, we're all dead. It's, we, it doesn't matter who you fall in love with or who sucks or whatever, we need the environment. To the left side of the triangle, the bottom left side, it's your food, it's your culture, it's your community you have to work on. These corners feed your body and soul. Environment up top, food, community, culture on one side, and then diet and nutrition on the other side. These three points make up the body and soul. And that's my guiding, um, that's my guiding light. It sounds, oh, one of the soap operas my mother watched. But, um, 
but that's my guiding light now in terms of, you know, what am I going to do? What can I do for my community outside of what I do for my profession? And how does it tie in? And this is where Joy of Feeding comes in. It's an international food fair, I call it. Um, I go to a lot of conferences. I talk about local food and farmer's market and sustainable eating. And then I realize at some point that I'm just preaching to the, con to the converted. It's the same Caucasian people every single place that I go with a token immigrant or the token, you know, with a token non-Caucasian person. And I'm not anti-Caucasian, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I thought, wait a minute. We need to encourage people to cook because farmers, mar this whole thing of sustainable agriculture isn't going to get anywhere until we start cooking again. And if we don't start cooking again, how are we going to nourish these whole points of the triangle? We don't have a community. We don't have a culture if we're not showing generosity. And how do you show generosity? You love people and you cook for people and you eat food that people serve you. And so Joy of Feeding, every year we do, it's a fundraiser for UBC Farm. And I literally go out there and I stalk strangers and I find 16 home cooks, no professional cooks, 16 home cooks from 16 different heritages cooking excuse me, their family favorite meal that they grew up with. So you as the guest, when you come there, you get to taste food from Cambodia, but not restaurant food, what mom was feeding her kids. You get to taste food from Azerbaijan, Sudan, Malaysia, India, Fiji, South America, uh, South America, South Africa, Zimbabwe. But you get different foods from different heritages. That's what we're celebrating at Joy of Feeding. And they serve the food with their loved ones. And you walk into the event and I do a little recipe booklet. And um, with the recipe booklet comes a plate and you've got full access. I mean, it's $50 a ticket and all 50 of that you know, money goes to the UBC farm for their program on world sustainable agriculture, meaning how can you actually feed the world sustainably? Not just the people who shop at farmer's markets. I love the farmer's market, but we gotta get beyond that. How do you feed the world sustainably? That's the program of the farm that Joy Feeding supports. So Joy Feeding is an extension of myself, is an extension of my restaurants, an extension of the women I love at my restaurants, is an extension of customers. And finally, the other thing that I do is what I'm wearing right now is what I wear when I'm cooking in my kitchen. I figured I don't need to follow any rules because I was never taught any of the rules. So that's another thing. When I cook, it's my world. It's my world that I created. I love my world. I would never preach to anybody else how to do your world, but I do preach to you have the confidence to create your own world and not worry about what others think. So thank you.